Praise God. Wow, what a great... <laughs> Matt, Pastor, as we were worshiping and uh, after you got done uh, baptizing all these wonderful folks, God just spoke to me that there needs to be response, and I'm so glad that you followed through with that. And people gave their lives to Christ. Come on, give it up for Christ. Come on. Amen. 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 Real quick, if you like Starbucks coffee, how many like Starbucks coffee? How many like just like coffee? All right, there we go. So here you go, Jeffy. There's some Dominican coffee at our table in the foyer. We want you to stop in there. I brought home 350 pounds this year. Do you know what kind of a pain in the neck it was getting through customs with 350 pounds of coffee? They opened my bags and went, ay, ay, ay. And so we got through because for those of you that don't know, that's how they smuggle drugs. And uh, we, we had to let them open up a few bags so that they could see that we were, we were uh, on the up and up. And uh, we want you to stop by and pick up some of that on your way out. Just see my wife, Debbie. In fact, here's my wife. Debbie, stand up and say hello. Come on. 38 years. I'm a blessed man. Um, we are so blessed to be here. Listen, we had some video set up for you, and uh, I just really believe God wants us to get into the Word. So that's what we're going to do. I wanted to tell you about what we're doing in the Dominican Republic. Most of you know what we're doing in the Dominican Republic. This year, your pastor and several people from your congregation went to the DR with us, and we saw uh, and treated and examined uh, 3,000 people. And uh, we, we had a baptismal service just after you left. Over 75 people baptized in water in the ocean. And uh, Pastor, while we were doing that, one lady on the beach, she was a worker there on the beach and selling her wares and uh, her, her crafts. And she gave her life to Christ and came down and was baptized too. So this thing is contagious, folks. Yes. <laughs> But the best part about all that we did this year and all the mobile clinics and all the people that we were able to treat and the medicine that we were able to give out is that somewhere between seven and 800 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? And that's, that's what it's all about, is about people being changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I did have someone ask me, what do you guys do when you're not in the Dominican Republic? Well, we're doing logistics for our missions trip that takes place every year. This year's going to take place from June 22nd through July, or June, June 22nd through June 30th. If you'd like to go, please see us. There's also a lot of information on our website, prayer cards in the back. Please pick those up and, uh, and uh, pray with us, and we'd love to have you go on the trip next year with us to the Dominican Republic. We are excited about what God is unfolding for us there, and the divine divine uh, appointments and the strategic alliances that only God could set up. How many of you know that that's, that's a God thing? It's all a God thing. So we're, we're very grateful for all of that. And uh, we just ask that you pray for us. I, want to do, I do want to say this, though. Thank you. Thank you to the missions board here. Thank you to each and every one of you. Your giving shows that your heart is right aligned with God's. Right. Because your giving to us is not giving to us. You're sowing seed that is actually bringing forth a harvest in the Dominican Republic. And up to this point, over the last 11 years, more than 15,000 people have given their lives to Christ. Come on. And I say thank you to the missions board. This year we got back from the Dominican Republic. We had many obligations and responsibilities to meet after that huge endeavor with 224 team members from six different nations, 18 different states, and over 45 different churches coming in at once to, uh, to saturate the North Shore of the Dominican Republic with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And your missions board stepped up and sent us a check that was totally unexpected and thoroughly blessed us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give your missions board a hand. Come on.
This year, since August, we've seen about 170 people give their lives to Christ in our services across the United States. Well, that's what Debbie and I do when we're not in the Dominican Republic. We're out sharing hope. Because how many of you know that we live in a world that's void of hope? Come on. I mean, there's no hope out there. There's not any hope out there apart from Jesus Christ. And we're so grateful to be able to share his word with people around the world. Let's pray. Father, we invite you to continue shaking this place this morning. From the north to the south, to the east to the west, from the roof to the floor, you have already shook our world, God. Your presence, God, is so evident in this place this morning. And we just ask, God, that you would do a work in us today, God, that you would challenge us where we are, O oh God, with your word, God, and take us up a little higher to sit with you in heavenly places. God, there's more. You've got more for us, God. And God, that's what we want. We want more. Not for our selfish needs, God. Not for our selfish selves, God. But so that we can in turn go out and touch others with the more that you poured into our lives. God, let it happen today. Help me to preach your word with truth and clarity. Father, your people would hear and believe. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said. This church is so blessed to have this man of God here as your pastor, Richard Crisco. He is. Come on. Absolutely. There's a lot of things I can say about Richard Crisco that are accurate. First of all, listen, friends, he is a visionary. He truly is a visionary. He's innovative. He is also very contemporary. He's a lover of people. Come on. He's a lover of missions because missions is the heart of God, reaching and seeking to save that which is lost. He's a 21st century leader who's sensitive to the cutting edge of what God is doing in the church right now. And he is also a want-to-be deer hunter. <laughs> the only thing I have to say about my age is if Pastor Crisco, if you would stand up here for a second and turn, who has more gray hair? Thank you very Wisdom, much. Wisdom, wisdom. And I would agree with that. <laughs> a recent survey concerning what people would give up if they had to live without some member of their body, the number one on that survey that people would give up is first of all their hands, because you can live pretty easily without hands, as long as you've got somebody that likes you by your side for the rest of your life. <laughs> the second thing is that people would give up their feet because there's apparatuses that we can use to get from point A to point B. The last on the list, the very last on the list that people would give up is their eyes. You see, a visionary is one who can envision the future, one who has unusual powers of foresight. And here's, and here's the definition that I find so intriguing that I found from a secular dictionary. A visionary is a person given to the fanciful speculations and enthusiasms with little regard for what is actually possible. Sounds more like a def definition of a person of faith to me. Come on. Yeah. This book here that we have called the Bible... The word that was made flesh and dwelt among us, this book is filled with stories of individuals who are visionaries, who are given to fanciful speculations and enthusiasms with little regard for what is actually possible. People like Nehemiah, when he was rebuilding the wall, all of his buddies and religious friends said, You can't do it, but he did it. Right. Noah building the ark out in the middle of the desert, building a battleship to house animals. And people say me doing medical in the Dominican Republic is crazy. Come on. I mean, that is off the chart. 
Joshua marching around Jericho, a several story high wall that's built more than 20 feet wide of solid stone. And, and, and he tells his people, we're going to march around it and yell, and it's going to fall down. Come on. Would this guy fit into the definition of one person given to fanciful speculations and enthusiasm with little regard for what is actually possible? Right. I would think so. David slaying Goliath. That's just Peter and John at the gate beautiful when they looked down and saw the lame man and he said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Thank God for men and women today who are alive today. Thank God for those men and women, but thank God for men and women today who are given to fanciful speculations and enthusiasms with little regard to what is actually possible. Come on. The definition of vision is this, sight, the ability to see. The formation of a mental image of something that is not perceived as real and is not present to the senses. Hebrews 11.1 1 says it this way, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Therefore, we can conclude that a visionary is one whose faith has become sight. Right. Faith has become sight. Now, it's possible to follow a visionary. It's possible to admire a visionary. It's possible to support a visionary. It's possible to come to church with a visionary. It's possible to learn from a visionary and still not have caught the vision that God has for your own life. Come on, come on. Jeremiah 29, 14 is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. And I love it when it, you read it in the message version. You look at it, message translation, Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14, it says, I know what I'm doing. This is God speaking. Man, when you know what God's doing, you don't have to worry. Come on. You can rest in peace. Doesn't matter what comes against you, you're not ignoring it, but you can rest in peace. I know what I'm doing, God said. I've got it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans. Now, what we're talking about here is blueprints and roadmaps for your life. I know I've built a lot of things, and I've had to follow some people's blueprints that were pretty messed up. It's meant when you go to put everything together, things don't fit right. That should have been 28 feet long instead of 8 feet long. God says... I've got plans to take care of you, not abandon you. I've got plans, I've got blueprints to give you the future you've hoped for. And let me tell you what, when you start, he starts putting all the pieces together, they fit perfectly. Yes. And then God says this, when you call on me, when you come to me and pray to me, I will listen. Yes. When you come looking for me, you will find me. Here's the contingency. Yes, when you get serious about finding me and want it more than anything else. Come on. You see, this is where the, the hiccup comes. Yeah. Because there's a lot of people that want to get in on the party. Right, right. Come on, girl. <laughs> Can I jump to the end? You see, there's a lot of people that come to church to get their praise on. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. If you came to church to get your praise on, then you are simply wasting your faith. <laughs> Jesus didn't die on the cross so you could get high in church. Come on. Come on. There are people who have become junkies. They have a junkie mentality, using the power of God to get high, while there is nothing wrong with celebrating who Christ is and what he has done for us. My struggle as I travel is that I see people focusing more on getting high than getting the gospel out to the uttermost parts of the earth. Come on. Yes. Come on, boys. I 
believe in faith that empowers you. I believe in a faith that motivates you. I believe in a faith that stimulates you, that empowers you to reach the uttermost parts of the earth. Yes. Come on. God says, I'll make sure you won't be disappointed. I'll turn things around for you. If you're in a position where you need things turned around for you in your life this morning, then follow what he says. Get serious about finding him and want him more than anything else in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Not the rewards, but him. Yeah. You see, he comes with, gosh, he comes with so many, so many rewards. There's so many things that come from serving Christ, but here, a lot of people are going after the things instead of going after him. Come on, sir. Come on. We need him more than the things. Yes. Because once we have him, the things will happen. That's right. You see, what God is saying to us here, we need to use this against the enemy of our lives to accomplish all that God has called us to accomplish. I'm really believing for God to do something more here this morning than he already has. Come on. And I'm convinced more than ever before, after going through what we've gone through the last few years, which have been kind of very unusual, that the things that the enemy has sent to discourage me have encouraged me. Come on. From my past experiences, friends, I recognize that it's Satan who is fighting me, and he wouldn't be fighting me like this if I were not on the verge, on the very precipice yes. of something extraordinary transpiring in my life. Yes. I know that. Sure, I've thought about giving up. Anybody that's human does. But I've decided against it. Come on. And this is why. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Yes. I'm convinced because I believe. On, now, if we're not careful, we can come to church and become cheerleaders of the successes of other people while failing to understand that God has a vision, that God has a plan, that God has a purpose for your life too. Amen. Amen. And he wants you to be successful in that vision he has for your life because God has placed things in your life and he will bless anybody who will, who will make themselves available to him. You see, if you will dare to dream about the things that he has placed in your heart, things that others are afraid to believe for, he, not you, but he will make it happen. Amen. Isaiah was a dreamer. He was a prophet. He was a visionary. He's referred to by theologians as the eagle eye prophet because of his keen discernment and his innate ability, friends, to see long distance and with great detail while describing the things that were about to come to pass. If you look at Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1, it's, I mean, we're just going to read the first verse, so you don't have to turn there. Just remember Isaiah 6, 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was about 59 years old at this time, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. Now, he didn't see the Lord as the Lord standing right next to him or in flesh and blood. He saw the Lord in a vision, and this is what he said. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I'm just going to deal with I saw the Lord. You see, Isaiah had a propensity to walk in the realm of the Spirit more than to regard the circumstances of his time because Isaiah understood that seeing God causes you to become more like him. Yes. You cannot fake, come face to face with a living God and not want to become more like him. Every day that you serve Jesus, every day that God does something miraculous in your life, like giving you breath, every day that we stand before him and that we pray and that we seek him, we get a little bit closer to him and we become more like him because we want his character in our lives. Isaiah knew that. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. If you're taking notes, point number one is this. The visionary Isaiah, he focused on where he was going more than on where he was. 
He focused more on where he was going more than on where he was. You see, God isn't really concerned that much about where you are. He knows where you are. God's not concerned about that too much. What he's more concerned about is where you're going. Come on. I'm not just talking about the unbeliever. I'm talking about the believer. God's concerned about where we're going. Isaiah was a visionary. When you consider Isaiah at this moment, he was called to minister, and how this moment occurred in such a powerful way, friends, that it set off a domino effect, friends. It set off a domino effect that for the rest of his days that determined the rest of the days because he had an encounter with God at a very early age. How old was Isaiah when he had this encounter with God? 20 years old. Well, that's not early. Listen to me. The earlier you can learn the power of a vision, the earlier your faith becomes sight. And the longer you can operate in it, and the more you can do because of it. Let me say that again. The earlier you can learn the power of a vision, the earlier your faith becomes sight, and the longer you can operate in it, and the more you can do because of it. I wish I knew 30 years ago what I know today. I would have still married the same woman. That's just a side note. Thank you very much for letting me have that time. I wish I'd known back then what I know now. I think I would have preached differently. I know that there's some things I wouldn't have done the same. But you can't live your life in the past. You gotta look ahead and see where you're going. And that's what Isaiah did. Everyone needs a vision. My son Jeremiah was four years old. He was in the back seat of our car driving down the road when he declared one day, he picked up his Bible that he was, his dedication Bible. He used to carry that little thing around everywhere. He said, when I grow up, I'm going to read and preach this book. Woo! Come on! That's vision! That's vision! Hear me, people. We need to touch, teach our children about vision. Yes! They're never too young to begin teaching them little George, Sally, Sue, and, and Joe. Asking them, what do you want to do when you grow up? And then followed up by saying, well, what are your plans to get there? Are you serious? You want to ask a four-year-old that? I'm asking my four-and-a-half-year-old grandson, Frankie, and he's blowing my mind. Come on. It's never too early. Here's the problem. Too many parents today are absent without leave. They place their kids' sports programs, school dances, and their kids' friends as priorities, above and beyond exposing and feeding their children a steady inflow of the word and faith. Come on, Kurt. Teaching them and encouraging them at an early age to follow Jesus. Oh, well, we teach them. Listen, the earlier that they can learn the power of a vision, the earlier their faith becomes sight, the longer they can operate in it, and the more they can do because of it. Yes! I wonder how many, how many Christian leaders are in our homes running around at four years old. I believe there's a lot of them. Amen. But if you're going to be absent without leave, mom and dad... They'll never develop the potential and, 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 and reach the destiny that God has for them. Oh, things can happen, sure, but you set the foundation. That's right. You sent the tempo. It's tempo. Let me get back to my notes so I don't get in trouble. You see, there are a lot of people listening today. Maybe you're listening today via live stream or on the Internet. Many who need to hear this word expounded and declared because some of you are so close to what God is doing and wants to do in your life, you just need a little motivation. You just need somebody to encourage you on. You just need a little bit of a push because some of you are so close, you can smell it. 
I said last night, I told, I, I said last night that I come into the house and my wife's making brownies. Man, I'll tell you what I do. I hang around the kitchen to wait for them to cool because I'm so close to it. And as soon as I can get it into my mouth without it burning my tongue, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Don't you stand there and look at me like that. You go in for the kill and you are victorious. Don't spend your life looking back at your past, thinking about where you have been or what you could have done. That's the destructive force of the powers of darkness that will kill your future hopes and dreams. Listen, Jesus has come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You can't get that by looking backwards. Leviticus chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. Just write those scriptures down. Here the Lord spoke to Moses and commanded the priests. That's who you and I are. We're the priests. Right. You're a royal priesthood. Say, I'm a royal priesthood. I'm a royal priesthood. You are a royal priesthood, friends. That's exactly who you are. And the Lord spoke to Moses and commanded the priests to take out the ashes of the burnt offering which the fire has consumed off the altar and carry them out. Why? Because they represented that which is old, that which is used up, that which has no value. He told Moses to have the priests carry that stuff out. You know, those ashes represent our past victories. I would say those ashes represent the $309,000 that you gave last year to missions. Come on. I don't know about you, but I'm shouting because you guys gave $309,000 to missions. Come on, give it up. Yes. That's something to declare and to be thankful for. But how many of you understand that $309,000 has been spent? Right. So it's just ashes. I wanted to burn it, but it probably, you know, my luck, we'd end up burning a little bit more. You got to carry out the past victories. You got to carry out the past defeats, too. Maybe you pledged this a much, much last year and you were only able to give this much and you feel defeated. Carry it out. Forget it. Right. It's old, it's done with, it's burned up. It has no value. You see, ashes will hold you back. They will snuff out, they will choke out any chance of a new fire or flame. Then he commands the priest to put fresh wood upon the altar. I would call, call that a new offering. So the perpetual fire shall burn on the altar and shall never go out. How many of you are following what I'm saying this morning? Secondly, anything that affects your vision will impair your mobility. Anything that affects your vision will impair your mobility. For those of you that wear glasses, you know exactly what I mean. And we can see a little bit, but it impairs our mobility when we take off our glasses. You've got to have clear vision. Debbie and I travel in a motor coach that we were blessed with. And without that motor coach, I, we couldn't do what we do today successfully. One day I had to fly into a city and stay with a pastor with my wife and I, and I get up early in the morning. I'm an early riser. How many of you are early risers? Yes. yes, yes. It's just not from deer hunting. I just like getting up early. It's always been my habit, get up early, 4, 4.30, study the Word. Then I'd preach, and, and, and my wife, now my wife, she, wherever she is, where are you, baby? She'd stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning. You think she'd ever see the sunrise? I don't think so. Uh-uh. So I got up one morning while we were at this pastor's house and, and I went into the bathroom to take a shower and I took off my glasses, got in the shower, turned on the shower, and then I looked for soap. I couldn't find anything. So I'm looking around, I'm squinting, I'm looking around, and I finally see this thing hanging on the wall. I go, oh, great, a soap dispenser, yes. So I turn around and I'm now I'm looking, how do I get the soap out of the soap dispenser? I can't see, I don't have my glasses on, so I, there's a button. I hit the button, I hear the button go beep, 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 and all of a sudden it starts spraying out this stuff going, and I thought, 
hey, this is really cool, and I just like did this, you know? I got sprayed down, got out of the shower, put my glasses on, and recognized that was a scrubbing bottle, bubbles, automatic shower cleaner. It's a real life story, friends, no kidding. Anything that affects your vision will impair your mobility. Yeah. Taking off my glasses affected my vision and my mobility was impaired. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 42 through 45, read it later. You guys all know the story. If you don't, you can read it later. After Joshua had the showdown with the 450 prophets of Baal, we see Israel paralyzed by a three-year drought. Elijah climbs to the top of Mount Carmel, which is incidentally, we've been there. It's just absolutely an amazing place. But it was right there in that majestic place that, that Elijah confronted the drought. I'm going to say something else that might torque somebody here today. God cannot fix what you will not face. Come on. Oh, I'm just going to let God handle it. And you give no thought to it whatsoever. You just totally ignore it and say, oh, I'm just going to let God handle it. The Word of God is confrontational, friends. Right. So follow its example and stop being a passive bystander in this thing. Come on. God didn't call you to be a passive bystander. Parents, you know exactly what your kids are doing. You know what's going on in your kid's life. Confront your children. Yeah. Oh, but they'll get mad at me. Duh. Yeah. Oh, but they won't like me anymore. You don't know what it's like around here when my kids get angry. Who's the parent? Come on. I'm going to say that again because you all need to hear it again. Who's the parent? God has given your children all kinds of friends. God didn't call you to be the friend. God called you to be the parent. Yes. I'm in trouble now, Debbie. Help me. You see, if you don't confront them, then the powers of darkness will. Oftentimes, people deny dealing with things in their lives, and they're just expecting God to take care of it. They, 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 they love God, and they're just going to let God take care of it. But you know what? God isn't going to take care of it if you're going to ignore it. This drought wasn't going to end without an intervention of confrontation. Elijah was a visionary, and he saw it. You see, he faced the problem. Visionary can see, visionaries can see possibilities of what others have already declared impossible. Right. Now, I'm not calling, I'm not talking, listen, friends, God doesn't want you to be weird. He just wants you to be real. Elijah goes up to the top of Mount Carmel. His servant accompanies him. Elijah gets down in a birthing position and begins to pray. And then he tells his servant, go, look towards the sea. The servant does as he's commanded, returns and says, hey, I see nothing there. Six times Elijah's servant came back with the same report. On the seventh time, he saw a small cloud the size of a man's hand rising out of the sea. Come on! It's one stinking cloud, little thing. How can that build any faith? How can you see anything in that? But the man of God, the visionary, whose faith had become sight, could see what no one else could see. You see, if you can see the invisible, then you can do the impossible. Yes. Because you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. What Elijah did, what Elijah said, he didn't see a small cloud. Elijah saw a thunderbuster through the eyes of faith. Here, listen, friends, the vision you see is but a commercial of what God is about to release in your life. Come on. Think about that. But if you... If if your faith has not become sight yet, 
You see, we've got a lot of people in the church. The faith hasn't become sight yet. I, I know this is hard for some people to, to grasp, but, you know, when they... When, when I told people I'm, I'm resigning my church, a very safe, comfortable, uh, very, I could stay there another 20 years and I'm going to do medical missions and I don't operate. I don't know nothing about, I know a lot more than I did now about medicine, but I still, if you come to me for medical help, you will die. <laughs> it's still true. But God gave me a vision. And it was the day that I stepped foot in the Dominican Republic. He gave me a vision for a Christian school. He gave me a vision for an orphanage. And he gave me the vision for an ambulatory surgical center. Friends, that was over 11 and a half years ago. Well, What's the problem? Well, there is no problem. We're still working towards it. Right. And my faith has become sight. And we're not giving up. We're moving on. Well, You've got to see it through eyes of faith. You see, that's what keeps you moving in a forward direction. When God has placed something in your life, it's just a commercial of what God is about to release in your life. And so let me tell you a little bit of what God's about to release in our life. In another month, I'll be in New York City meeting with a philanthropist and picking up a check for $200,000 for our orphanage. I like that. Yes. Another church has already paid for, given us the money. We already have it that will build our entire 60 by 80 foot storage facility for all of our, our, our equipment and our building materials and our construction equipment in the Dominican Republic. We only need $1.8 million more to build the surgical center. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Your faith needs to become sight, church. Yes. That's what God wants out of our lives. Two years ago, we had three people come into our clinic who was totally blind. Now listen, vision without faith is like a picture without a promise. Vision without faith is like a picture without a promise. Let that sink in a little bit. Because it had to sink into me as I was driving down the road and the Lord spoke that to me. I can see the city of hope in the Dominican Republic. But unless I have the faith to fuel that, it's nothing more than a picture without a promise. Our faith needs to become sight. We had three people come into our clinic two years ago that were totally blind. There were whites of their eyes. It was completely whited out. Cataracts over their entire eyes. They could not see. They had to be led in by someone else because of the loss of vision impaired their mobility. And so they were all brought in. They were doctors, our ophthalmologists and optometrists said there's nothing that we can do for them. They are blind. They need to have cataract surgery or else they will not be able to see. We took them over to the prayer tent. The people in the prayer tent began to pray with them. Two of them immediately, the whites in their eyes disappeared. I'd say that's God working. And they could see. But the third one, she, her, her white of her eyes didn't disappear. But she said, I can see. So we took her back to the ophthalmologist, optometrist. They checked her out. They said, nothing has physically changed in this woman. There's no possible way physically that she can, medically that she can see. And we gave her a Bible. And man, as hot tears began to run down her face, she began to declare the word of God as she read that entire script. We're living in a day and age, friends, in a humanistic, amoral society without any absolutes. If we are going to be successful reaching our families, our communities, and this week, this nation, and someday around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ, then our faith needs to become sight. Amen. We don't have to live with this anymore, friends. 
Faith must become sight if we're ever going to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish in this world. We've got to see what others can not say. Can you say amen? Amen. To be able to see clearly is truly an incredible gift, which is our secret weapon. A blind man in Africa came in contact with this man. My first trip to Africa. Now, a room like this in, a in Africa, we could seat 2,000 people. In the Dominican Republic, probably twice that many. They pack them in. After I got done preaching and people were saved and then we had, they had to ring the bell to stop the worship. The bell was actually a, 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 an old rim that was without the tire hanging from a string on a tree limb. They had to ring that thing to keep the people from worshiping or else they'd work, continue to worship all day and all night. And so when they got done with that and the service was over, I asked my interpreter, Abel, what's going on? Because they started to sing again. And, I, and they said, we are now going to have a healing service. And I thought, I'm ready for some horizontal solitude service. <laughs> and, and, and they brought this, the four guys, two guys on each side of this old gray-haired, gray-haired for you, gray-haired blind man. <laughs> and his eyes were totally whited over, and they were leading him down the aisle, guiding him. And I said, Abel, are they going to pray for the blind man? And Abel, he kind of like, no. Kind of one of those kind of responses. No. This is the man that God uses to heal the sick. He said, what? He said, God gives him visions of the people he's supposed to pray for. Now, wait a second, the guy's blind. But God gives him sight. To see who he's to pray for. And as sure as I'm standing here, I saw people healed. But yet he continued to be physically blind. I'm wondering how many of us would choose to be physically blind and spiritually see. If we had the chance to be physically blind, but yet see with eyes of faith that could change people's lives and draw in the nets and see literally millions of people come to Christ and fall to their knees. church needs to rise up and seek the giver of the gift and allow him to make your faith to become sight. Pastor said something earlier, yesterday, last night, sometime. He said that his dream would be to see this church Give half a million dollars to missions. You know, I'm not, I, I, I don't think that that's far off. In fact, I think that could be this year. If you allow your faith to become sight. I, I really believe that. Well, Pastor, my experience isn't lining up with the promise that God gave me in my life. Listen, friends, God is no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. That's right. That's right. And if you allow your faith to become sight, God will show up and do the supernatural. I believe that. I believe that. I'm going to believe what God has placed in my heart for the Dominican Republic, and I'm going to believe with this pastor for what God has placed in his heart for missions for this church. Why? Because I know that I've been given a vision 
And I believe that he has too. And we're not going to be persuaded by any better argument. Can you say amen? Amen. I'd like you to... Yeah, I... I have some things I have to do. But the first and foremost is to make sure that that you have an opportunity to response, respond to what God has spoken to us this morning. We're, we're, we've blown the clock. It's been worth it to meet with Amen. you. So let me, just, let me just say this. If you're here this morning and, and you, want, you want God You're here and you want to be one who is given to financial speculations and enthusiasm with little regard for what is actually possible. And you want your faith to become sight. On the count of three, I'm going to ask you to stand your feet wherever you are. Don't, don't look around. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anybody else wants. What do you want? What do you want? Do you want to be one who is given to fanciful speculations and enthusiasms with little regard for what is actually possible because you serve a God in whom all things are possible? You want your faith to become sight on the count of three. Stand your feet. One, two, three, wherever you are. Would you just put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you right now, on both sides of you, wherever you are? If somebody's not near you, somebody, I mean, there's so many people that have responded, the whole, almost the whole congregation. I am so moved by your response. Because your response shows your heart. Your response says, God, whatever you want, whatever you want to do in me and through me, I'm an open, willing vessel, and I want my faith that you've placed in my life to become sight, to reach the masses, to reach Oakland County, to reach this nation in the uttermost parts of the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray, Lord, for every person here. There's a point of contact taking place right now between brothers and sisters in Christ all over this sanctuary. And it's because of who you are, God, that we can stand here and declare you are worthy. It's because of what you have done for us, God, that we are here today basking in your presence, seeing people's lives change, God, watching people go from death to life through baptism. God, we're seeing things happen here today, God, and we're sensing your presence here in a very real way. So, God, we're praying right now, Lord, for our faith to become sight. Let us see the invisible so we can do for you the impossible. Let us fulfill the destiny that you have called for each and every one of us, oh God. Yes. Father, I thank you for your church. And I thank you, God, for the world changers in this room. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you for their faithfulness, God, to you, for their world vision to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. Thank you for the leadership team in this body of believers, God. Thank you for pastors who have a passion for souls, no matter what it takes. Thank you for a mission board, God, who will go through all the work 
and to the extent that they have to do this missions convention, Lord, it's just not a convention. It's a concern. Fueled by the love that you have poured into our hearts for the lost and dying around the world. Thank you, God, for giving those gifts to your church. Now, Father, we're going to do something in a moment, God, that I pray would be would be a history-making moment for this church and for the lost around the world. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, and everyone said, amen, amen. Would you please be seated for a moment? I got to... I got to finish this up, friends. This is how we're going to do it. Under your seat, you have one of these. I'd like everyone to pick one up, please. This is important. Last year, this church pledged $197,000 to missions. That in itself is incredible. But what's more remarkable is that at the end of the year, you guys gave one-third more. You guys gave $310,000. Come on. Exactly. Now, some of you have already turned in your faith promise pledges. And right now, they have over $70,000 in pledges for this next year. There are people like the Babcocks and others that you guys support around the world that are dependent upon you to touch their nations that God has sent them to with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They can't do it without you. You know, God has called some to go. He's called others to send. That's right. Not everybody can go, but everybody can send. Right. Oh, well, I don't have any money. Yeah, you do. Get rid of the poverty mentality. God didn't call you to have a poverty mentality. That's right. He didn't. Are you are one of those faith preachers? I hope so. A faith promise is exactly that. You're saying, Lord, I'm going to have, I'm going to let my faith become sight. And I'm going to do something extraordinary for your kingdom. Somebody may say that I'm crazy, but God, I'm willing to have my faith stretched and to believe you for X amount of dollars every week. 10, 25, 50, $100 a week, whatever. $500 a week. Is it possible? You bet it is. But you don't know where I'm living. You don't know what I got. Let me tell you what, the most precious offering that we have ever gotten, we have ever received, don't get me wrong, we need money to make this happen, but when we got an offering envelope with two pennies in it, do you remember that, baby? Some little kid in the, in the audience pulled out two pennies out of his pocket and came up and gave it to us after the service. You see, everybody can give something. Everybody has something to give. So you say, God, I'm going to give $100 a week to missions. Well, you know what? You're believing God for that. And you know, if you allow God to use you that way, I believe God will bring it into your home. I believe God will provide it. Now, there's nothing wrong with being wealthy, friends. God gave you this this morning. As I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with being wealthy. God wants to bless us. He desires to see us prosper. But listen, God does not give us wealth to be all that. You know what I mean? To be all that. You don't need to drive a new car every two years. People need to be saved, though. Your new car, my, my question is, is, is it worth a soul or a hundred? 
God does not give us wealth to be all that. He gives us wealth to reach, to reach the lost, to reach the poor, to reach the brokenhearted, to reach the abused, to reach the hurting, to reach the captives, to reach the sick. The reason Jesus said it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle is because man has a habit of hoarding his wealth for himself when God gave it to him to bless others. Yes. That's it. To reach the poor, to reach the hurting, to reach the sick with the goal of changing the eternal destiny of humanity. God gives us wealth to win. Yes. And what are we fighting against? The powers of darkness who want to win, want to put a stranglehold around the neck of every person that is walking in darkness. But Jesus has come that we would win and that they might have life. Yes. I got to stop. So here it is. God gives us wealth to win and to break the chains that bind and to set the captives free. And that's it. So, while I've been talking, I hope you've been praying about what you're going to put down on your card. Put something down on it. Pray. If God doesn't give you a definite answer this morning, then take it home and pray and bring it back and give it to one of the ushers or give it to one of the uh, pastors here at the church. But I want you right now. Father, I pray, God, for your people as they contemplate what they're to do today. It's about souls. It's not about money. It's about souls. It's about having the heart of the Father. The heart of the Father is evangelism. The heart of the Father is missions. So I pray, God, that you would speak and let faith arise in your people as to what to do today for their missions pledge in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said,